Good day, everybody. My name is Brad. I'm one of the pastors here at Copper Hills, and I'm glad to welcome you, especially those of you that are at home watching. You tune in each week, and uh, I want to say welcome to you as well. We're glad that you do check in and you follow along. Every week there are about 230 or 40, 50 uh, clicks of people that are tuning in from all over the world, actually. Somebody, hello Ireland, somebody from Ireland almost every week tunes in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's an Irishman right there. Yeah. Uh, hey, I, I, if I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, I really would like that opportunity. I'm going to be in the plaza area right after this gathering, and uh, I would love to say hi to you. If you're at home and we haven't met, uh, hopefully we can soon. Uh, as each week goes by, and uh, more and more people are feeling a little safer to be out and about, uh, they've had vaccines or whatever creates some safety for them, uh, we're the thinking is we're going to come back to campus, and each weekend we see more and more people doing that. And so before I take you to Mark 14, the next scene in Jesus last week, I want to ask you to help us with something. As more and more people come back to campus, there is a very unique role that's a very important role for new people to encounter. We have some core values that kind of function below the surface. We don't talk about them a lot, but they just, they're kind of there and they guide us in some things. We want to be a church that isn't just friendly. We actually want to befriend people. We want to help people move from attending, you know, that's my church where I go, to that's the family I belong to, from attending to belonging. And we want to help people move from observing, from standing on the sidelines to, uh, to actually serving because we're all given abilities and talents. And when our whole family serves together, we're really strong in that. And we want to help people move from rows like we are into smaller settings, into circles. So let me say what I began to introduce. Right now, we need about 30 people who would be willing to join our host teams. That's hosting out in the plaza and hosting here in our auditorium. And uh, if you can help with that, we so would love you to do that. Uh, we'll train you. We'll give you one of those nifty blue shirts that you see. That's worth, like, the price of admission right there. Um, so you can go to our office uh, email site, chc at copperhills.org, or you can even go to our website and uh, let us know there that you would like to participate in that area. We really would appreciate it. We partic particularly would appreciate if uh, folks in their 20s, 30s, and 40s would sign up to join our already uh, experienced team of people that are doing that. So don't look to someone beside you and go, I think you're probably one of those 30. <laughs> you're one of the 30. So if you can help with that, would you let us know? We would really appreciate that. Okay, uh, I want to take you to the next scene from Jesus last week here on earth. And uh, we've been working through this over the last several weeks, and uh, we're now at a place where we're talking about what's happened on the Thursday evening before the fateful Friday. And uh, let me just catch you up. If you're not familiar with the story, you haven't been tracking along with it, or maybe you just have slept the last weeks, so I'll catch you up. The Sunday before the Thursday, Jesus comes into Jerusalem as a conquering hero. Monday, that night, he goes back out to Bethany, probably. Monday, he's back in the city in the temple courtyard. It's the most holy place for Jewish people in all of the world. And there, Jesus sees some things that just disturb him, and he's frustrated with, and he's disappointed that it is how it is. He sees people so cavalierly worshiping his father, the God of the whole universe. And he kind of creates some chaos in that courtyard temple or court. Te court Te temple courtyard by turning over the tables of these pop-up retail businesses, leaves the temple courtyard, goes back to Bethany very likely, comes back on Tuesday, and the religious leaders are waiting for him. They want to confront him with what he did the day before. They're up in his grill over this, and he deftly uh, challenges them and their thinking, and they have these, this interesting conversation. At the end of the day, Jesus goes back to Bethany, and there he meets a woman who takes her like what would have taken her a whole year to earn, that value of a aromatic oil and breaks the jar that it's in, pours it over Jesus' head as if to anoint him for what comes. But for her, I think it was far more personal. She just couldn't think of anything else to do. It's all she had, and she gave everything she had to Jesus. Then Wednesday, don't see much happening. Thursday, Jesus is back in the city of Jerusalem. He has arranged for the upper room of a, of a, a building, probably a commercial spot on the lower level, and residence on the second level. And there he's going to have dinner with his friends, one last dinner with them. And that's kind of where we want to pick it up 
following that meal. I'm going to overlap just a little bit where I was last week, but it's an overlap of that. So if you want to click on or turn to Mark 14, we're going to start in verse 25. Here's the interesting thing to me, at least the introduction part of it, is this. Mark, who this, where we're reading from, is likely taking Peter's account of his life with Jesus, but Mark's writing it. And for some reason, Peter asks Mark to record something that would have been highly embarrassing, even shocking, self-disclosing, humiliating, and very personal. And Peter asks Mark to record it, and that's what we want to look at tonight. It's really surprising. Like, I got stuff in my autobiography you're never going to know about. I'm not putting it in. But Mark... Uh, puts this in because Peter directs him. So here's what it is. Dinner has wrapped up in that upper room, and we pick it up here. Jesus speaking, I tell you the truth, this is verse 25, I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Now you may recall this meal that they're having as a celebration of something that had happened a thousand or more years earlier where God had rescued the nation of Israel from captivity in Egypt, and uh, there's a meal that is... Uh, had by everybody who trusts God with what he's given as instructions that they are to take a lamb to kill it, put blood on the doorpost and doorframe of the home. And if they do, uh, an angel that takes the life of firstborn sons is not going to take their firstborn son. And everybody who believed that and did it is spared. And Jesus has a meal where he now references himself as that lamb that has been slain. And uh, it's kind of a cryptic and mysterious way that he does it. The guys don't really understand probably exactly what he meant, but they sure will in the next 15 hours. They're going to discover exactly what he had in mind. So when Jesus said, is, this verse says, one day they're going to drink wine together in a new kingdom, we kind of pass over that in this passage, and it doesn't really land for us, and it probably didn't land for them. The best that these Jesus' friends could think of probably was, oh yeah, there's a new, there's a new kingdom going to be established, Jesus is going to be the king, and we're going to have wine and good food, and we're going to have all of that, and Jesus has just said, till I usher that in, I'm not going to eat, and I'm not going to have wine. They may not fully have understood, probably didn't, but this is what Jesus says, and so the meal ends without explanation, this is how verse 26 reads, it says, then they sang a hymn, and they went out to the Mount of Olives. And that's where we left it off last week. Pick it up from there. They apparently leave this upper room. They head to the south side of Jerusalem, up a hill, to which was the Mount of Olives. And uh, on their way back, apparently it appears to Bethany. They stop at a place uh, called the uh, Gethsemane. And uh, it's a park-like place. And this is where they stop. Verse 27 says, On the way, Jesus told them, All of you will desert me. Now this is the second time this evening that Jesus has said this. The first time happened over dinner. For the scriptures say, God will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. He's referencing an Old Testament passage, Zechariah 13, 7, where Zechariah, this prophet from God, is talking about a time in Jerusalem's history that's very dark, very bleak, and they are without leadership because their leadership has failed. And so he's speaking, uh, using that metaphor, bringing it into the current situation that Jesus is, is referencing. Uh, and then we read on in verse 28. But after I am raised from the dead, I will go ahead of you to Galilee and meet you there. Peter said to him, even if everyone else deserts you, I will never. He apparently didn't hear that Jesus was going to die because he's concerned more about the desertion than he is about Jesus dying. Verse 30, Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, Peter. This very night before the rooster crows twice, you will deny three times that you even know me. No, no, no way, Peter declares emphatically. Even if I have to die with you, I'll never deny you. And all the others vowed the same. So it just all, oddly enough, the conversation just comes to an abrupt halt. They must have arrived at the Mount of Olives so the conversation carry, couldn't carry on because the theme's going to change as they go into this garden. Here's what I want you to notice. I want you to notice that Jesus says something three times, once in last week's passage, and I'll bring it up on the screen, but twice in what we read now. And it's, I think it's really important that we would catch what Jesus says here, even if his friends, when they heard it, didn't catch it, and even if we read it the first time, or maybe you've read it before and didn't catch it, I want to point something out to you. It's really important. He says something three times. Let's put up the first time 
that he says it. Mark 14, 18. It says, as they were at the table eating, Jesus said, I tell the truth. I put it in yellow. I want you to notice that. One of you eating with me will betray me. I tell you the truth, he says. I tell you the truth. This is something that Jesus rarely says. He does a few times, and when he does, he says it to get everybody's attention. It's like, listen up. This is important. It's a pivotal statement. It's of paramount importance. Don't miss this, guys. It's crucial that you would hear this. Other translations will translate this in these kinds of ways. I tell you the truth, or truly, truly. Any of you are King James fans? You know the term verily, verily then. This is what Jesus says three times to them. Here's what I found interesting about it. In the original Greek text that is translated into English for us, when uh, it was used in a Hebrew setting, the Hebrew word was used, and when the Greek translators translated it, they kept the Hebrew word. They didn't translate the Greek equivalent to it. So what is the Hebrew word that they didn't translate into Greek? You're very familiar with it. You say it at the end of every prayer. Amen. Amen. It means the same thing. Verily, verily, amen. Uh, this is what I say. Listen up. Truly, truly, I tell you the truth. That's what amen means. So, you know, thank you for the food. Amen. Very good. Very good. He says it this way. Hey, get this, though. He says it this way. Amen. One of you that I'm eating with is going to betray me. That gets an amen? Really? In other words, listen up. This is vital. Don't miss this. One of you around the table is going to let me down. You're going to betray me. This is really not what you want to hear when you're having a friendly dinner. It's really not. But this is what Jesus says. There's a second time he does this. This is Mark 14, 25. This is where he says, I tell you the truth. Verily, verily, I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Apparently, the promise of drinking wine together someday in the future was another really, really important statement that Jesus wanted them to catch. Here's the third time that Jesus says it in verse 30. I tell you the truth, or amen, or verily, verily, Peter... This very night before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times that you even know me. Hey, everyone, listen up. This is really important. Verily, verily, Peter over here is going to deny me three times. It's not going to be a good night for Peter. Why in all the world does Jesus do this? What's the point of these, this verily, verily three times? Three times he says, Amen. Everyone here is going to betray me. Amen. We're going to, have, we're going to have a glass of wine one day. Amen. Peter specifically is going to deny me tonight. What's going on here? What does this mean? Okay. Let's look at, let's brand, bundle these together. Let's look at verily, verily one and verily, verily three together, but start with verily, verily two. Are you with me? What's the deal? I want to try to explain to you what the deal is and why it's so, so important. So here's verily, verily, number two. I tell you the truth. Verily, verily, I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it new in the kingdom of God. What Jesus is saying by promising not to drink wine until the new kingdom is established is important for us to know. We often pass over this part of the scripture. It doesn't make much sense to us. It's kind of a blow-by. He's probably talking about heaven. Something's going to happen in heaven. Wine's going to be included, but he's not going to have wine until we're all there together. What's the, what's the deal with that? Well, here's for us, okay? The common way of saying what we say when we really, really mean it as little kids is this. I really, really mean this. I cross my heart and hope to die. Stick Stick a needle in my eyes is ridiculous stuff. But why do we get our kids to say that? Because we don't want them to lie. We want them to tell the truth all the time. And so we get them to add that to it as if to say, I promise you, Mom and Dad, this is what I'll do. I hope I die if I don't, and go ahead and stick a needle in my eye. Have fun. But it's all about emphasis. It's all that Mom and Dad are convinced, certainly, that little Johnny is going to do what he said he would do, right? Well, this is kind of what Jesus is saying. He's saying, I promise, verily, verily, I'm not going to drink wine till 
the new kingdom comes, so what? Well, this is a serious vow that Jesus is taking. We see something very similar to this in the first century church in Acts 22 and 23. In the earliest days as Christianity was emerging, one of the uh, key leaders of the Christian movement was a guy by the name of Paul. You recognize that name, right? He's the guy that opposed Jesus and opposed the church and has this dramatic change of mind and change of heart on the road just outside of Damascus, turns his whole life around, and he becomes the greatest advocate for the move of Jesus, the risen Messiah on the face of the earth. And what he does after he finds Jesus, he starts traveling around the known world, going from city to city, and teaching people about who Jesus is, that he's alive. He was dead, but he's alive, and that's not popular in some places. At one point, we read that Paul circles back, comes to Jerusalem, and he brings people who aren't Jewish with him into the temple area. Uh Uh-uh, don't do that, Paul. That's bad news. That's in-your-face kind of stuff for Jewish people. But Paul does it, and the religious leaders, the Jewish religious of the leaders of the day are upset with him. They're ticked off with him. And they convene a court, the Sanhedrin, and they're going to bring Paul up on charges of what he's doing, bringing Gentiles into the Jewish temple area, to which a group of people are so upset with Paul for doing this. This is what we read in Acts 23, 12. It says, the next morning, a group of Jews got together and bound themselves with an oath not to eat or drink until they had killed Paul. There were more than 40 of them in this conspiracy. They went to the leading priests and elders and told them, we have bound ourselves with an oath to eat nothing until we have killed Paul. What Jesus is saying when he says something something similar, he is saying that not drinking wine till the new kingdom is established is so important to me. I am making a vow to you. This is a promise. I promise that I will not drink wine until the victorious new kingdom is established. And we think of that as eternal life in heaven. In fact, Matthew writes the same thing where Jesus in Matthew's recording adds, I will not drink wine till till I'm in heaven with you, together with you. We're going to do something together, but till we're together, I'm not doing. So what's the point? In other words, what Jesus is saying There is no higher goal or higher mission for me, nothing, than to get you home with Father. And I will not partake of anything else till I get you home with Father. I'm committed to that. You can't just pass by what Jesus says when he says he's not going to drink till the new kingdom happens. He is saying, I commit to you. Cross my heart and hope to die, which I will that I will get you to Father. I promise you that. I promise. And then when we, do our, when we are there together, we're going to have wine together. We're going to have a meal together, you and I. But I'm not eating till I get that done. It's like these people that promised to kill Paul and they weren't going to eat or drink till they had killed him. Jesus is saying, I'm, like, there's nothing going to stand in the way of this. I am going to do that. This is the magnitude of how much this matters to Jesus. But let me tell you how far that he will go to see it happen. Not only will he not eat and drink, the odd meal that he had just wrapped up with his friends was demonstrative of this, that the lamb who would have been killed as part of the Passover ceremony, we said last week there's wine on the table, there's bread on the table, but there's no lamb on the table because the lamb is at the table. And the lamb is going to die for them. Amen. I tell you the truth, truly, truly, verily, verily, I'll never let you down nor ever let anything stop me from getting you to Father. Amen, indeed. Now, here's the thing, the two verily, verilys that bracket it have to do with that statement and why it profoundly amps the value of that middle statement. Here's the two statements that bracket it. Hang with me here for a second. Mark 8, 14, 18 says, As they were at the table eating, Jesus said, Verily, verily, one of you eating with me here will betray me. Verse 30, Verily, verily, I tell you the truth, Peter, this very night, before the rooster crows twice, you'll deny three times that you even know me. 
Amen. Verily, verily, you all are going to let me down. All of you are. You're going to betray me. And to betray Jesus was simply this. I have something of greater value than our friendship. I'm going to betray our friendship. I'm going to disagree with you. I'm disappointed with you. I don't like you anymore. I don't want to be with you anymore. All of you are going to do that. Verily, verily, that's what's going to happen. Second verily in there is, verily, verily, amen, Peter, you're personally going to let me down and you're going to deny that you know me. You're going to turn to people and say, not only am I going to betray him, but I don't know him. He's nothing to, to me. He's nothing to me. What Judas does is unthinkable. What Peter does is worse than that. What Jesus is saying here, by including these bracketed verily, verilys around the verily, verily that he's not going to eat or drink till he has that meal with us, is to say, say this, I know that all of you are going to disappoint me. I know that. And Peter, I know you personally are going to disappoint me. But I also want you to know I'll never disappoint you. I'll never let you down. You will let me down, Peter. You'll personally let me down. But I will never let you down. But here's what's so amazing. I'm not going to let you down even though I know you will. I hesitated whether I should share this with you or not, but I'm just, I'm, I'm going to, I hope you'll get my, my heart in it. Um, a couple of weeks ago as I was thinking through this passage, Alfie and I were driving together along the 303 heading east toward I-17. And I turned to her and I said, uh, Elf, I'm reading an interesting passage right now about Jesus, uh, how he knew that his friends would deny him and betray him. And even knowing that, he said, uh, we're still going to have that meal together in heaven. Nothing's going to stop me from getting you to Father. I said, Elf, it's terrible to think about, but if you knew I wasn't going to be faithful to you, what would you do? Like you knew that for sure. What would you do? Now, she'll tell you that she thinks that's an impossibility. And so the answer she gave, I would fight. I would do everything I could to prevent that from happening. I'd fight for that. But what would you do? Like, really, what, this is real, real stuff. What would you do? Some of you have experienced this. What would you do if you knew that someone you cherished and loved and was so important to you would betray you and fail you and be unfaithful to you. I think of, reminded of this as last week, many, many years ago, I don't know, 15, 18 years ago, somebody came into uh, our office area just right at 5 o'clock, and uh, he walked into my office. I didn't have a chance to even greet him. He walked into the office, closed the door, and he fell in a fetal position in the corner of my office. I was sobbing, uncontrollably sobbing. I couldn't talk with him. He couldn't answer me. I went and knelt down beside him, and I'm silently praying for him, and I don't know what's going on. I don't know what's going on. Finally, he is able to gather himself enough, and he sits on a chair, his head in his hands, and I can barely hear what he's saying, but he mumbles this. He said, I just got home from work, and I found my wife in bed with a colleague from work. And the only thing I could think to do was if I was either going to kill them or I was going to come here. And I chose to come here. I don't know what to do. So what do you do when somebody unthinkably does something to betray you and you know they're going to do it? Do you hang out with them? Are you interested in them? Do they matter to you? Or would you just as soon write them off and go, I don't want anything to do with you. I'm out of here. I don't have to put up with that. I know what you're going to do, and I'm not going to get hurt. I'm out of here before you hurt me. Not Jesus. In fact, he gives this incredible promise. Nothing will stop me, not even my own death, from getting you to Father. Though I know what you're going to do, like all of you. And Peter, you specifically, I'm getting you to the Father. 
To me, it's an incredible description of the love of our God and care for us that he would do this. I noticed this as well in this passage. Uh, there's another time where Jesus tells his friends that they're going to betray him. In verse 27 and 28, it says, on the way, on the way to the garden on Mount of Olives, Jesus told them, all of you will desert me. For the scriptures say God will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I've raised you from the dead, I'll go ahead of you to Galilee and meet you there. In other words, I know you're all going to betray me, desert me, deny me, but I'm going to go meet you there anyways. We're, we're going to meet up in Galilee. We are. I'm not going to abandon you. I'm not going to write you off. And I'm not just going to meet you in Galilee. I'm going to meet you in eternity. Though I know what you're going to do. You see, this is the good news news story that we call the gospel. You see, you and I are not rescued by our commitment to Jesus, but Jesus' commitment to us. That's what rescues us. That's what redeems us. That's what changes us. It is in our commitment. It's not even the massive size or the minuscule size of our faith that does it. He does it. And he knows all of us are undeserving. All of us are going to let him down. And to all of us, he says, but I won't let you down. I won't. There's this wonderful story in Mark chapter 9 that we kind of skipped over uh, as we were going through the first chapters of Mark. It's this dad who has, I suspect it's a little boy. The scriptures don't give us the age, but I somehow picture it as a little boy. He's, uh, he's got a seizure disorder of some kind that uh, may be demonic or it may be something else, but he has these grand mal seizures that cause him at the most inopportune times to fall on the ground and be stiff and foam at the mouth, and sometimes he has them even close to water or close to fire, and he lands in the water or lands in the fire. It's a horrible story. And then this dad, kind of in desperation, brings his little boy, I think, to his Jesus' disciples, and they can't help. They can't do a thing for him. And so they're kind of arguing together why they, why they can't fix this little boy. Jesus comes along and goes, like, what's going on here? To which the dad says, well, you know, I asked, but they couldn't, they couldn't do it. And uh, I'm wondering whether you can, Jesus. To which Jesus says, whether I can, all things are possible if you just believe. And then this is where I connect with the dad. Maybe you do too. He says, I do believe. Would you please help me with how little I believe? Would you help me with my unbelief? To which Jesus turns and says, well, I don't think you should be here right now. Like, we need people of faith right here. Like, why don't you leave? Why don't you go home and read your Bible a little more? Maybe if you prayed a little more passionately and fervently. You know, there's people that you haven't forgiven. You better forgive them first of all and get that stuff straightened out. And then come back and let's see whether you're good enough for my grace. Well, of course that's not what he says. You know what he does? He heals the little boy. Because apparently it's not the size of faith that matters all that much. It's his faithfulness. It's who he is. It's how he operates. It's, he's the one who says, verily, verily, I will get you to Father. I will do that. Some years ago, somebody helped me through a season and time in my life. This is a lot of years ago. When I couldn't muster up enough faith to believe that God would do something. And uh, he told me a story. I'm going to modify it a little bit. But it really helped me. I, I wonder maybe it'll help you. There's a uh, young family in Arizona who have never seen cold weather and never seen winter. But they have some family in Minnesota in January who invited them to come spend a couple of months with them. How cruel is that? <laughs> That's just cruel. But they love this family and they decide to go. They get to Minnesota and they discover that their family that they're going to visit is on an island. And what stands between them and their family is frozen water. They've never seen this before. It's a new phenomena for them. But dad figures, well, we're not sure that it's going to hold. I've heard about this kind of thing. So here's what we're going to do, kids, wife. We're going to get down on our bellies and spread our weight as much as we can. And so they're all flat on their tummies going across the island. And they're just moving along like this. Suddenly it happens. 
the ice starts to rumble and roar and shake and starts to crack. And they go, oh, no, this is it. This is it. And uh, just when they think it's over, a giant 4 by 4 truck comes riding across the ice on them, up the other side onto the island. So they get up and they walk to the other side. They walk to the island. Two months later, it's time to go home. They wave goodbye. They walk onto the lake. They fall through and all drown. That's a tragic story. So here's the thing. Thick ice, a little bit of faith. Thin ice, a lot of faith. It's who we have our faith in, not how much faith we have. See, Jesus is thick ice because he says he's thick ice, because he's the one that died, because he's the one that gave everything. And so when he makes a promise that says, verily, fairly, I will get you to the Father, he's getting you to the Father. And you don't have to have a lot of faith in that. You have to have enough faith to go, I can't get to the Father myself. So Jesus, as unworthy as I am, will you get me to the Father? To which Jesus says, hold on, I'm about to die, and I'll get you to the Father. That's the price I'm willing to pay for you. Now, you're going to have to admit, I can't get to the Father on my own. In fact, I've done a lot of things to try to get there unsuccessfully, and I've done a lot of things to walk away from him giving up on him. But today changes that. Today, I've got a little bit of faith in the thick ice, and I'm going to lean on him. You see, that's what's so wonderful about what Jesus says here. Verily, verily, Amen at the front end. We put it at the back end. Jesus puts it at the front end. Verily, verily, I tell you, you're all going to let me down. Verily, verily, Peter, you specifically are going to let me down. And verily, verily, I will get you to Father. Do you trust him enough? Just enough for that? His character is sure and strong. He never never lets us down. Jesus, thanks. Oh, and that's such a cheap word to say. Unless this is what we've experienced, and then we can't think of anything else to say. But words of gratitude, appreciation, thankfulness for being a person of your word at great cost to yourself. Somehow in that, Jesus, it gives us the power gives us the power to live in that place where just like we mess up and we let you down, others mess up and let us down, and somehow we can forgive. Somehow we can start anew. Somehow, Jesus, because this is what you've done for us, there's a power inside of us to be renewed, to think differently, to think well, to believe the best. Because we follow one who, in spite of knowing what we will do, promises to get us to Father. Thank you, Jesus.